Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to my channel. Remember, don't forget to subscribe, make a comment, and hey, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. <laughs> Anyways, today, I'm trying to figure out exactly what I bought here at an auction sale. I seen a motor, I fell in love with it, I had to own it. It's a 19, 1934, 1930-ish, somewhere in there. What do you figure, XA, X, what are they? Uh, two choices we have is an XA model or an XB model. XA or XB. One's a three horse and one's a four horse, I think. Is that what it says? Correct, yes. So I don't exactly know, but we're just looking around to see. It's got a sh the old carburetor on it here. It's kind of interesting here how it turns the clutch on it. Right there. Guy could cut your hand almost on it, but... We gotta find some parts. I wanna make this motor run. Um, I got a guy that I met at one of the car shows here this summer over in Notch Hill. Has a whole bunch of Model D parts and I've talked to him. And we're gonna go over there and look around and see if we can find a coil. It's actually called a buzz box. I don't know a whole lot about it. A little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, and that's what this motor runs on. And this engine, I do believe, it is a two stroke engine, believe it or not, back in 1930s, we'll say. A couple things, this is the water pump. This here's the water-cooled exhaust manifold. Obviously, this motor is out of a boat or for boat applications, hence the propeller. It's kind of interesting. This here is be your distributor ignition, ignition timing. Distributor, ignition timing. There's a brass piece on here, right here, on a ring, that every time it makes contact like that, It'll send the power to the buzz box, and the buzz box, being the coil, will send the, the, the electricity up here and make the spark. So, when you want them advance or retard, this timing, when you go to start it, put her back, put her like that till it runs. You come back here, adjust your carburetor to wherever you want it to run. I do believe this is the choke. I'm not sure what this is. I think it's maybe an accelerator pump, maybe to give it a shot of fuel into it. I don't know a whole lot about this motor. It's kind of a learning experience. So, we can all learn along together on this one. I do believe this is an oiler, obviously. I don't know. I think it may be oil connecting rod, possibly. I don't know. I can't answer that question. I don't know. But I do know it's a two-stroke motor. You have to mix the oil and gas with it. Um... These here are oilers or greasers. After a couple hours of running or whatever, you give them a turn and it puts lubrication down to the crankshaft bearings on the manger, on, on the crankshaft throws. And I do believe this one here, I do believe it may oil the rod along with the oil mixing the gasoline. So you got a kind of a couple different systems in here for lubrication. This here oils part of the crankshaft with grease. This one here orders, oils the rest of the whatever it may be in the inside. Plus, it takes a mix of oil and gas in the motor to burn. And it's kind of cool. It's a learning experience. As all as I know is we're going to the Model T guy to look for some parts. He has a buzz box there, and he can maybe explain it a little bit better to me. Again, this technology is 80 years old, 75 plus, somewhere in there. This stuff is very interesting and very different. So I'm looking forward to getting this thing to run. Transmission. I know what this is, a pepcock here. That's compression coming out of there. Now what happens is you put a little bit of gas in there and give her the what for, like that, and it'll start and fire. It's that kind of a decompression lever and a primer all at the same time. When it starts, shut it off, and away you go. So this is the coil you were looking for? Yeah, this motor I have is a yeah. 19, I'm not too sure even what year it is. Okay. It's a 1930, 1930-ish. A variety. Okay, it looked earlier than that to me, but... If you think it's earlier? It said it's a 1904, but I don't know if it is, because it's yeah. got aluminum head and aluminum piston. Yeah. And supposedly that come in in 1934-ish. Okay. Is yeah. when that come in, so... That, 
that could be. Yeah, I know that just looking at the style, it looked early, so. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. fairly interesting. And again, I do believe it takes, hence the word buzz box, buzz eh? Buzz box, yeah. Buzz Can you coil. explain a little bit of that buzz coil? How sure, it... yeah, yeah. So power comes in, uh, actually on the bottom. Okay. Power comes in and then the signal from the distributor comes in okay or your uh, well there's a little there's a little your, brass uh, piece on a slip ring yep. with a brass piece on it sure and then a lever back and forth so that'd be your points i guess yeah. your contactor yeah basically your contactor it, it tells it and then it shoots out the voltage so is it here and it goes out here and then what does yep. that do on top this there is what they call the vibrator part so this little points in here come down and i don't know if you can get in and see all the way but right in here yeah so you see a set of points there that open up when i put my fingers on that you can see it but there's a second set of points up underneath this piece here and when i push down on this you'll see them pop down a bit and that's what vibrates i know that vibrate like crazy now hence for somebody not knowing what you're talking about that'll break it'll break it'll collapse the coil when it vibrates it's collapsing the coil well, it's vibrating all the time shooting out spark Right. Now, does it not have to collapse to uh, charge the coil and collapse the coil? The capacitor's in here, and it does do that, but it does it at a very high speed rate. Because I know that thing there will, so, it'll shoot a spark yeah. like that all day oh, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah it just... Because it's, it's a very interesting system. Yeah. I know one thing yeah. you do not want to get electrocuted by, because it'll definitely no. get your attention. Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll spark you right up. How much power's coming out of there? I'm not sure. 12,000 volts? I don't know, but man, Probably. oh man. I tell you what, it'll yeah. shoot us but anyways. Oh yeah, yeah, you, you tingle all the way down. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> not a good thing. I got electrocuted on yeah. the Model T I was dicking with. Yeah. But anyways, you set that coil, you have a machine here that sets it? Yeah, I've got this little box here. No, is it charging yeah. something up or is it just... No, it just takes a second for the power to come on, right? So, so then that's uh, a capacitor check. This is your coil set. So you hit the test and it'll fire. And so your coil's good. Then you put it on for, um, now you want it, you're gonna wanna see this part here, this little window. I'll push this button. Oh, wrong one. Oh, there she goes. Yeah, so that's how she goes. Just buzz, 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 and it keep buzzing as long as there's power there. This shuts it off again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, when it's doing that, when you put 12 volts on here, or six volts, whatever you wanna use, cause they don't care. Oh, so you can, you can use 12 you volts can use on 12 it. Volt on okay. These. Yeah, yeah, they don't care. And then that thing, you'll hear it buzzing. Mm, hence yeah. the word buzz box. Buzz box, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when you have a Model T, you'll have four of those. But they only buzz when the crank is in the right position for each one. Right? Otherwise, it grounds it out. So just, okay, grounds it out, then it puts yeah. the power to it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And when it's buzzing, it's yeah. making power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So. And it's throwing spark and yep when you get a hit yep <laughs> it'll definitely make you pay attention make you wake up for sure yeah now you said on here to take and this is kind of a standalone thing so you said on this here you yep. just right here in the side yeah you can put a little spring clips i've got another one over here let me grab show that. me show me what it looks like so here's here's mine oh, so, okay and all you do is put your wire underneath right and then it tightens on where the hell did you get these from <laughs> I got this one like this. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. But uh, I guess a guy could find something. Oh, up. yeah. 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 Your hobby shops for electrical stuff, right? You know, um, and that way you can just hook it up and leave it as a standalone setup, right? So you can have it sitting in a little tray beside your engine. So you can mount right? this any position. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. It doesn't care. Yeah. Well, see, the interesting about that is the Model D motors, they don't have any oil pump in them, do they? It's all no, splash it's system. All splash. So you got nothing putting. The, no, like, not, no, the splash puts the oil in. It's quite surprising how well it actually works. Just like right? a Mulberry's and Stratton. Yeah, yeah, basically same idea. I mean, look at all they run, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, splash works. It's, it's a good system. How long have you been doing this for? Oh, ever since I was a kid. Yeah. Seriously, where'd you yeah. grow up at? I grew up in Surrey. Surrey? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, wow, a lot of changes and, there. Uh, well, big changes there. What, what did you do? What was your first job? Oh, I, I actually drove truck for a living. Oh, well, what kind of truck did you drive? An old Mac? I drove some old Macs. No. Okay, old yeah. <laughs> digger. Ken, Kenworths and freight lighters. Okay. And yeah, just about, you name it, I just about drove it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I used to run the highway years back and pulled trains up and down the highway. And oh, I'm not a very good truck driver. <laughs> so this is the actual block. 
It's somebody's froze it or what? Somebody froze it. So I'm stitching. I'm in the process of stitching up. You can see the stitching I've been doing here. I'm going to leave these patches that somebody put in already. Now explain stitching. Okay, that's a cold process system. So you drill a hole, you tap, thread it with tap, and then you screw the screws in. And I'll show you the screws here. Let me grab one and uh, give you a better idea. Now, here's the question, why? Well, some guys will weld and do it. Some guys will braze. And you can see somebody's brazed it once somebody's before. Somebody's been in there and created a somebody, problem. Somebody welded as well. And it looks like the weld took pretty good. And I'm almost tempted to weld it, but I didn't realize till later that this block has a lot of nickel in it. But I didn't realize that till later. So the more nickel, the easier it is to weld easier on. Easier it is to weld on. See, you sure. use a piece of back in the day when I used to blow starters off boats, because mm. your boat motor, the flaps on the back of the boat, oh yeah, for the exhaust mm. would break and it would suck water in. You hit oh. the starter and it would blow. Yeah. You hit the starter button and it would be in the cylinder and you either bend a rod, sure. but in the process it would blow the starter off of it. Oh yeah. So if you got lucky and it just blew the starter off the mount, right. you'd go in there with some nye rod. Oh yeah. And weld, weld it with it. weld it with some nye rod. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, so, back to this stitching. So stitching is a cold process, so you don't have to worry about that heat problem with cast iron. Yeah, because it breaks it. and stretches. If you weld it, cracks. it'll look beautiful yeah. for about approximately about one minute until it cools down and they go bang! Yeah. And then exactly. you go, oh, that's, that's nice. That's not what we want to do. Yeah, it just right? it just breaks the weld so, because the material yeah. doesn't move at the same speed as each other. So exactly. it'll pull it, literally break the weld apart. Sure. So I chose to go with this cold process of stitching with these little pins. So you drill a hole, you tap it, and if you want to get a closer up view of that, that's the pin, and it has a little socket head on and top. And it just shears right? off, eh? And that shears off when it gets in tight. Now, the interesting part about this, if you feel the thread on this, you'll feel it bite you. Well, it's sharp. Yeah. It's got little teeth, and those little teeth <laughs> will grab that metal and pull it in as opposed to exposing it out. Interesting. Yeah. I take it you're gonna sleeve this motor? Yes, I have to sleeve it. Take it right in here, if you look right in this whole cylinder here. It's got some bad pits in you See the bad pits in here? That there, now sleeving, yeah. you bore the cylinder out bigger, yeah. and then you get another piece of round material, yeah. and either cool the material down, heat the block up, cool the material, yeah. your sleeve it, down, yeah. and then shove it in there, or press it in there, and then yeah. it does its, does its yeah. thing. It does its thing, and it stays there, and you're good to go. And then you just bore it to size. Right. Now here's the next question. How rare is this block? This is very rare. This is why we're stitching it together. Because you can't just go out and get another one. So I'm far, a, I only know of four other Risco V8s existing. If you need to ever find parts for any of this weird stuff. Yeah, you give me his number. R&M. Yeah. You take a talk and they're hell of a good guys I down. I mentioned it. He, he doesn't know of any parts for this. <laughs> Oh, they tell you what, then that's super rare yes. because they deal with some strange oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very, very, very rare. They now, probably only produced a few hundred when they produced them because the car, the Briscoe car, only had a production number of, I think, 3,700 cars total. The V8 was an option. You had the four-cylinder, and for, I think it was $200 extra, you could get the V8 model. So... $200 in 1916 was one hell of a lot of money. Well, considering, yeah, it'd be a lot. Yeah. You what could, was your average you could, buy, wage? you could buy a brand new Model T for a little over 400 Something so, they were worth, eh? Yeah. Well, the, the, the Model T came down in value over the years. Henry Ford made it better, dropped the price continuously. What was his motto? He was going to bring the people from the country to the city and the people from the city to the country. The common man's car. The common man's car. And you could have it in any color you wanted long as long as it was black. black. Yeah. And here's the joke of the day for you. <laughs> what time was it when two Fords pass on the road? What time was it when two pass? I don't know. Tin past tin. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the tin Lizzie, eh? Yes. Tin oh, past yeah. tin. Yeah. 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 So in 1909, Henry Ford brought out the Model T. It was $895. You could get it in several colors at that time. In 1927, you could get a Model T for $298. And you could get it in different colors. And the other thing that I know about him, <laughs> it was the, you know, the first of the coming of the assembly line. Mm -hmm. And his people were the most well-paid people, oh, yeah. I think, yeah. in, 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 
Yeah, I think it was 1915 he made the five dollar day, right? Which was really something back oh, then. Oh, it was huge. He announced that he was going to pay his employees five dollars a day. The next day outside the gate was something like a million people wanting a job. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. And that's in, what's it called, Rhineland, Heartland? Uh, no, it was... Uh, Give me the Rhineland, it's German. In Detroit. Ah. Oh. God, there's a name for it. He had a little airport and stuff there. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was his area there. Uh, darn. Yeah, it's escaped. I can't remember what it's called either, but yeah. he had a name for it. Yeah. When he announced that, all the other companies, Chev and GM and all those guys, they said he was absolutely nuts. Why would you ever pay your employees $5 a day? You're going to go broke. And he got way more production out of them. He got way more production out of them. Plus, he got out, half of their staff came over to his <laughs> It's all I remember, <laughs> the little bit that I remember about the Flathead, the biggest problem they had, mm. hence, was the casting of the blocks yes. for the water jackets and the cylinders. Sure. It was one of the biggest problems they had. That's why them blocks yeah. are cast the way they are. They don't yeah. go all the way down. No. And this block here does not look like it has... It doesn't go all the way down either. It does go a fair ways, as you can see. It, it comes down about yeah. here. Uh, so it comes in quite a ways. So, but it still doesn't make her all the way so to the yeah, bottom. So it makes it down to there. Yeah. So it's a fair amount, but not all the way to the bottom. See, this was but a major, major thing casting this block back. This in the is day. a mono block. Do you realize that? Every V8 in, the, in that time era was bolted together. Two four cylinder banks bolted onto a common crankcase. That's what I'm looking at. It's right now. Because the little bit I know about the flathead is they had a real problem. Casting the block as one piece with yes. eight cylinders in it. Yeah. That was the major problem was, they had with the sand it casting. Took so long to get that. Yeah. In. Yeah. And this yeah. here is yeah. like back in the day. Yeah. You can see right here in the split split here for the mm -hmm. cope and the drag or wherever it was put in for the cast, eh? Yeah, that's the uh, mold. Yeah. 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 But it was this is a fairly mm -hmm. This a is one. a very elaborate casting. A very elaborate, because yeah. they didn't know how to it's very that's part of bringing it up very, very interesting. Yeah. Elaborate. Yeah. It very is not elaborate. Is very, very, company, very uncommon. The company that casted this is right on here. It's called Ferrell, F E R R O. They were a major marine engine maker back in the early days, like early hundreds, like 1900s, right? And they were the world's largest marine engine supplier at the time. They went into doing engines for automobiles around 1913, 1914. So that it ties back into again. Mm -hmm. Who cast the motor for this old marine block that I got? Exactly. Because that marine yeah. block was like again, it's cast nineteen. It by somebody. Nineteen. I don't know. This is sure. nineteen oh four on it. Right. Pat is nineteen oh three. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we don't. And so look two, for look for that. Look it, for Farrell. You never know. They could be related. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could have been casted for Saint. Was it Saint Lawrence or something? Saint Lawrence. Yeah. yeah. So Farrell could have casted the engines for them. That's very interesting how it all kind of comes around full circle on it. Yeah. And that other motor, that motor, this motor here that I'm working on is a two-stroke engine. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Oh, yeah. 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 But a lot of marine engines were two-stroke in that time. We just don't think about that because we yeah. just think, we think all yeah. the stuff is new technology that we use. Oh. But literally it's... So old. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, prime example, an overhead valve V8 1916. What the hell took so long? We didn't get overhead valve V8s till 1950. So this is uh, Scripps Booth. Now, here's, here is a real interesting story for you. This radiator was in a barn in Chilliwack. And the guy was having a, a sale on all the stuff that was in his barn because his uncle had passed away, right? This was up in the rafters of the barn. And I spotted it up there. I told the guy, I'd like to have that radiator. I said, I have all the stuff that's here. I want to buy that off you, right? He says, okay, no problem. So, he took it down for me and I took it home. I had no idea what this radiator was for or from or anything. It just had a V-shape and I wanted that for my Speedster. So I dragged that home and I'm looking at it. And I'm trying to figure it out. It's got two water holes for rad hoses on the bottom and one in the center at the top. And I'm like, well, this is odd. You know, most have one at the bottom, one at the top, right? Hence one water pump, one way in, one way out. Yeah, yeah. So I post a picture online to find out what the heck this is from because there's no markings to tell me what it's from, right? So the guy gets on there and he says, oh, he says, that's a 1916 Scripps Booth V8 radiator. No. Yeah. And I go, really? I thought, wow, this is crazy, right? So I do research on Scripps Booth and find out about their V8 engine and everything. I thought, Wow, wouldn't it be nice to get one of those engines one day, right? You know, dreams can be, dreams can happen. 
So I'm thinking, well, you know, I'll keep my eye online and see if I can find one of these V8 engines from a Scripps booth, right? Well, they're, turns out they're as rare as hen's teeth, too. So, wasn't finding one. Lo and behold, I'm on the horseless carriage website on their classified listings. And the guy has a posting up there that says a 1916 Briscoe V8 for sale. No picture. I thought, oh, okay. So I contact the guy, he says, send me some pictures. He sent me some pictures and I'm looking at it. It's got two water holes at the bottom, one water hole on the top. I tell you what, that's as rare as the engine is to find that. That's just about, <laughs> you know that, what I mean? You're building crazy, something out of right? with that motor, is, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It just, it's, and the headlights so, are, what are the headlights? Headlights are off of Franklin, 1916 Franklin. I have headlights off of a, they're a 34 something, they're in both, hmm. they that with a, I don't know what the hell they are, but they got the rating of the brand of the car in the glass on the headlights. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'll There's so many early ones. I'll tell you what, them headlights are worth a fortune, some of them. Some are, yeah, yeah. But uh, well, these, these will go on my Speedster with that radiator, which matches up perfect for the Briscoe V8, because guess what? The Scripps Roof V8, the Jackson V8, and the Briscoe V8 were all casted by Farrell. So it's all the same casting? And they're all by the same designer. Interesting. Yeah. So Alonso Brush designed these engines. And uh, so Alonso Brush had Brush Motor Company years back. And he actually went on to be one of the best engineers of the automotive industry. Uh, GM and all those guys used to go see him to get information that they needed, like tips on how to do something. Henry Ford even went to go see him. This guy was famous back then. The only thing with Henry Ford is it reminds me to, uh, what's the gauge block? What's his name? Her measurement. Oh. Joe Blocks, Johannes. Oh, okay. Johannes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for gauge blocks. Gauge blocks, yeah. 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 So, so anyhow, that just happened to come together. I got the radiator. Well, I told Two you Two years what. later, I find the engine. What are you using for right. a frame? Model T. I told you what, it should be cool. Yeah. It should work fine. I told you what. Yeah. I've got... Uh, an accessory transmission for a Model T that's called a Muncie. You used to bolt on the back of the Model T engine and the transmission. So you still had your Model T transmission, but then you had a secondary transmission to give you an underdrive, direct drive, and overdrive. So I've done all the gearing on it. With the wheels that I'm running on the T, it'll be much like a two-speed power glide in a 64 shell. No sh day. Right? So uh, low underdrive, what they call underdrive, will be like low gear on a two-speed, right? And a two-speed, you, you go from low to direct. Now, what transmission is on there? Is it an automatic, like a Model T, or what's the, what's the transmission? No, it's a standard shift. A standard. Yeah. Now, how do you find a transmission that bolts to that? Well, you don't, because they didn't have a bell housing. See, there's no bell housing on the back. So you ran a jack shaft from the crankshaft to your transmission, and you bolted your transmission to the frame. I have just realized looking at that mm -hmm. how weird of a motor that is <laughs> come here i'll show you something okay yeah. when we look at this motor the way it's sitting we figure that that's the center of the motor right here like this motor here okay yeah, hold that like this motor here where it cuts that's here the, the crankshaft and everything lays in there yeah okay so this, this motor here is totally, it, it is the same, but it's different. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. Yeah, this is your, your center line here, where it's bolted onto my, yeah. my stand. That's your center line, right? So, yeah, and then the back end is here. It's just, right? it's totally, it's... Uh, but there is no bell housing. There's no bell housing. See right here? There's a bell housing right here, how this bolts onto this motor here, I guess is what I'm... Not yeah. right here, how this bolts onto the bell housing here. Your transmission and stuff goes on here and whatever accessories or adapter plates. Yep. This here is kind of like, I don't know what it's like. Well, it's, it's just, it's just a shaft open. that comes out. The shaft comes out, your, your flywheel is gonna sit right in here. And you bolt whatever it is to the, however. Well, you run a jack shaft from your flywheel to your transmission, right? So that, that drives your transmission. Well, they figure that's a new thing because like, it's like the new Corvettes have the motor up here and the motor and the transmission is way back there. Way back there. So that's so old. It's so it's old. And all your hence your brand new Corvette <laughs> having, having everything separated. They had that back in the day. Yeah. 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 It was all, that was how it was done because they didn't have sophisticated ideas of casting up a bell housing and all the rest of it. 
like your Model Ts, they they run on a on a uh, oil pan, right? So your engine bolts to the oil pan, which also your transmission cover bolts to. Yeah, it's your different. transmission mm -hmm. runs in the same oil as your engine does. First, a Model right? T, first so, automatic made. Oh yeah, yeah, it's Sun and Planetary. Yeah, it's got yeah, you hit on the old band and away you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's super cool. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Anyways, it's amazing how it goes back to the marine industry. The marine industry. I'm working on a marine motor, and it comes back yeah. to the same marine design and whatever. Sure. They built. Yeah. And we'll start these building this were, motor. We're making these, and if you look at this, look how shiny that cast is. It's a nickel in it, eh? That's a nickel in it. I mean, this was cleaned almost three years ago, and it hasn't rusted. Be some good material in there, right? Yeah, and you know, you look at how that looks compared to the cast iron of a Model T engine, right? So yeah. Anyways, back to this wire. Back to that wire. What do you need? Twenty-four inches. Oh, okay. So we'll have to cut you a piece 24 inches. And how much money do I owe you for that? The wire and that and these clips? Uh, well, we talked earlier it was 40 and a new wire is going to be 20. Perfect. You get some genuine sock money. Okay. <laughs> oh, crazy. And I tell you what, you just don't find this stuff anywhere. No. Like you don't, it's, 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 I almost do. like finding a unicorn almost. I do because I'm always looking for it, right? Now, I like that. It's got a little bit of, it's got a yeah. name still on there. Yeah. I'll put uh, that. K KW there. And the sad thing about it is when it gets mounted, if a guy mounts it like that, you'll never see it, but. Oh, there's a piece of skews right in there? Yeah. Nice. Now that is genuine wire in there. There's no, there's no. Uh, That's genuine copper. Now, why we had this discussion before a little while ago? Why you don't want a carbon core in it? Well, it's not so bad for what you're running with, but if you're running a magneto, then uh, carbon wires don't work well with magnetos. No, why is that? It just just yeah, I'm not sure why it is, but yeah, yeah, I've, I've found that over the years, right? Guys, guys will complain that they can't get their bike started or whatever because the magnetos firing, but they're not getting the spark through properly, right? So. I tell you what, you know, one of these days when you're pouring some Babbitt bearings, maybe we'll come over and watch you pour some Babbitt. Sure. That's yeah. very, very, very interesting. Like I say, it's a lost, a well, lost art of what it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to get you to sign a waiver in case it blows up. Not a problem. Not a problem. With that. <laughs> just don't get the water. Does, does water create a problem in it? Water creates a huge problem. That's, It'll make that's it. Make where, it that's where the problem starts. That's eh? where, yeah. It just turns it to steam and explodes instantly. Ex eh? Yeah. Yeah, so at 900 degrees, I mean, yeah, if you hit a drop of water in there, it's going to blow. I just spied something with my eye that oh. I'm very curious about. <laughs> What's that? Them old style spark plugs. Oh, yes. Yeah. Champions. And I have a champion made in Canada on oh, yeah. this motor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. do they come apart? Can you clean them? Yes. Yeah. Well, depending on your plug, but hopefully. Yeah. So these... These are Model T ones. So, oh, this one doesn't. This is a modern replacement. Okay. Yeah. The other one I got in that motor must be in, we'll get an older plug there. Huh. Second here, let me get this old box out. Like I said, I have a few of them. I told you what. I have on my motorcycle, on my 42, I have air-cooled spark plugs on it. Oh, okay. They got right on the side here where it goes in, they got a, uh, there's a little oh, castle around castle there, there, holes through them, yeah. Oh, wow. So yeah, this is the type you want to take apart. You want to know something? That's the same spark plug that's in my motor right there. Oh, yeah. It's okay. a champion, and mine says made in Canada sure. on it. Sure, yep, yep. So right here, that yep. comes out there? Yeah, you, you take, take this nut here apart, screw, unscrew it from this part. And it's, it's actually a, a fairly deep sleeved. Part. Okay. And it goes on the taper to hold the plug down in. How do you know when it's too tight? Obviously. When it breaks. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what. And guys, just so you know, some of these spark plugs, it's not uncommon to have one of these spark plugs be worth $200. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some of them are. These, not so much, but some of the other ones. They had some neat green ones. I don't know if I have a green one in here now. Probably not. But they, yeah, there's some cool. I, I've got like brand new ones still. Anyways, when you take them apart, mm -hmm. the dumb question of the day, uh -huh. how do you clean them? 
Oh, a little wire brush. I use a... a wire brush or a brass wire brush or brass. a steel wire brush? I use a brass. Now, why is that? The brass removes a steel wire brush is way more abrasive than a brass brush, right? right? right. And it probably doesn't leave carbon tracking on the plug, or does that That's matter? basically what you're cleaning off is a lot of the carbon tracing. Stuff, okay, because right? obviously so when it gets carbon, then, carbon is a conductor, yeah. and it'll it'll want to make it want to spark it. Out, right? So, yeah, you just want to clean everything up nice and clean, right? And the porcelain, clean that up. I use this on the porcelain, right? Well, so I should, have, then, I should re... When you take yeah. it apart, I'm talking about cleaning the porcelain. Yeah. When you yeah. pull it out, the porcelain sure. will be kind of on a wedge sure. shape like that with the yeah. electrode. Yeah, your electrode's right yeah. there, right? That all comes out. Then you just clean all that carbon and stuff off, right? And then clean it with some, uh, I use uh, lacquer thinner, wipe it okay. down with, right? Yeah. And if, there's, if you're having trouble getting the carbon off, take some carb cleaner. You know what? Right? What about soaking it in water? You could try that. Water, I just, I water. Just, I you just use carb cleaner, right? Eh? Carb cleaner, yeah. I don't want yeah. pistons. If you have a really yeah. carboned up set of pistons, sure. throw yeah. them in a pail of water for like about sit. four or five yeah. days. Right. And it just kills the carbon on the mist. You don't have five or six days of waiting. <laughs> I don't move that so, fast. So I, I just use the carb cleaner, right? And it works. Gets it clean, right? So, yeah. yeah. Okay, my friend. Thank you for so, your time. Hey. Yeah. And hey, Good pleasure meeting you. Good seeing you again. Yeah. Uh,